All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Chris Charles. I will be your moderator for the on-site water reuse portion of today's program. Uh, before I uh, do uh, introductions, um, I wanted to go ahead and get a poll out real quick. I know you guys are, are wanting to get this uh, going, but I just wanted to, uh, the speakers would like to know um, how people are familiar uh, with on-site water reuse. So if you can answer this poll real quick, um, let's take about uh, 15, 20 seconds to answer this poll here. That way they get a, an idea of, of uh, who we're, who we're talking to, to and and uh, what we can what we can do uh, and how they can focus their uh, presentations. Sorry about that. All right, what's the answers? Oh, there are a lot of people familiar with this concept. That's awesome. But there's also a lot of people just learning about this. So we're mixed bag, 50-50 it looks like. Uh, so we'll go ahead and uh, close this out, and I'm going to introduce the first speaker. Um, her name is Catherine Jasinski. Uh, she's one of the colleagues here at, uh, I have at Austin Water, and she's been working there for over 10 years as both a regulator and a planner of decentralized reuse systems. She is the project manager for the uh, Wastewater Reclamation System and the City of Austin's new Permitting and Development Center, which is what she's about to talk about today. As a member of the National Blue Ribbon Commission for on-site uh, non-potable water uh, systems, she helps advance best management practices nationally to support the use of decentralized reuse systems within individual buildings and at the local scale. So let me go ahead and uh, pass it off to Catherine uh, so she can uh, tell you about this uh, awesome reuse system. Okay, thank you, Chris. And we, can, we, can, we can hear you just fine. And it uh, looks like, yeah, I just need to start it and you're, you're good to go. Okay. So again, I'm Catherine Jashinsky with Austin Water and I'm gonna be uh, presenting today on Oscar and Clara who are the stars of the city of Austin's um, on-site water reuse demonstration project. Before I uh, talk about Oscar and Claire, I just wanna give a little bit of background on why we, um, we embarked on this demonstration project. And that is largely due to the drought, uh, the historic drought that you probably all remember from central Texas and, and other areas of Texas that happened from 2008 to 2016. During that time, um, Austin's drinking water uh, reservoirs, they fell to historically low levels and then the inflows coming into the lakes, um, the Highland Lake system were at all time lows. And so we were really um, uh, questioning our, you know, our kind of our water supply planning strategies and that resulted in a recommendation from the city council to develop an integrated water resource plan. And this is a photo of Lake Travis in 2011 looking very, very sad and empty. So the integrated water resource plan is called Water Forward. It's a water plan for the next 100 years. That's the, the planning horizon for the plan. It was developed over three years with um, input from the community and a citizen's task force, finally approved by our city council at the end of 2018. And during the plan um, preparation, we evaluated different water supply and demand management strategies um, under different climate scenarios with all of the uncertainty around the future of, of um, climate change and then also growth projections with Central Texas and Austin in particular being experiencing um, a huge growth rate. We're expecting right now we have a, mil a million customers that we serve with just over a million in a hundred years. We're expecting that four million customers will be within our service area. So planning for that growth. Um, and while there are a slew of strategies within the plan, um, our City Council really wanted to focus first on our conservation and reuse um, initiatives, ordinances and incentives, and try to kind of uh, get our water demands under control before we look for new water supplies. And so within the plan, you'll see this kind of fit for purpose approach to water reuse. And um, when we're talking about on-site water reuse um, and, and reuse in general, we're talking about uh, reuse for non-potable applications. And so this graph is showing that um, 
the, the piece of pie in gray is where we're, we're using drinking water, drinking water quality for non-drinking water needs. And the piece in purple is um, where we're using non-potable or alternative water sources for, uh, for non-potable needs. So that's a match there. And then the blue is using drinking water for drinking water needs. And so over time throughout the next 100 years, we wanna shift that, that gray slice of the pie to purple and preserve our drinking water, only use drinking water for drinking water needs, and then use non-potable supplies for non-potable needs. So that's called the, the fit for purpose approach within the plan. And then also within the plan, we have these on-site water reuse goals for 2040, which is our kind of our, our nearest term planning horizon. Um, for on-site reuse in buildings, so individual just buildings by themselves, you can collect rainwater, which is precipitation from the roof, gray water, which is uh, drainage from your building coming from sinks and, um, and showers and things like that. Stormwater is precipitation coming off of the ground or like a parking garage. DC condensate is produced in a building cooling system. Heating and cooling system in the black water is the drainage that uh, contains like the toilet and organic waste. And so our goal for, for those kind of uh, scale systems is 5.72 million gallons per day. And then we're also looking at reuse and development clusters for campus type um, applications, districts, even um, brand new neighborhoods that might, might go in into a greenfield development. Um, and so we're looking at wastewater reuse and sewer mining and then potentially stormwater mining and targeting 3.85 million gallons per day. So if you add that all up, it's close to 10 million gallons per day. And so it's a big kind of lofty goal for these on-site reuse systems, especially for a a centralized utility such as, as Austin Water is. And um, how we're going to kind of get reach those goals is through a series of um, alternative water ordinances and incentives, uh, which we've already started to work on. And this is a, a timeline. The, the boxes at the bottom are showing you know, the water forward plan was adopted in, at the end of 2018. And we've already put new regulations in place for our voluntary on-site reuse program and have implemented an incentive program. And this program is really targeted at multifamily and, and commercial buildings. Um, and we're kind of starting there with um, targeting where these systems will be, will be um, installed first and really targeting developments over 250,000 square feet. And so that's, you know, it's, those are, fairly large projects and you'll see with our demonstration project it gives you a sense of the scale of what, what, what a building like that would look like. Um, and then eventually we wanna to shift to a mandatory program uh, where these development projects in three years time will need to install some sort of onsite reuse system in their building um, to, be, to get project approval in the city of Austin. And then on top, um, you know, while we were working on the water forward plan, we also decided we needed to do this demonstration project uh, to help um, kind of show the development community what is possible, what you can do with on-site reuse in a building, in a city, in an urban development. And um, the building that our project is at was completed at the, in the summer of 2020. And um, so the systems are in place and we'll talk about them now. So we have these uh, pilot project reuse goals. These are the goals that we started out with when we were seeking seeking um, this particular project, you know, where were we were gonna put it, what would it accomplish for us? So we really wanted to accomplish six things. We wanted to gain experience with on-site reuse. We wanted to create a water supply offset and augmentation. We wanted to do a technology test and maybe criteria development, stretch our business model, provide an opportunity for education and community outreach, and then showcase sustainability and adaptive, adaptive utility management. We found this perfect building and this perfect opportunity at the city's new permitting and development center. I mentioned it was completed last summer. It's a 260,000 square foot building, which is designed to office up to um, 1,000 personnel involved in the planning and development process for the city of Austin. So what better perfect place to have um, a demonstration project in the building that the uh, development community has to come to to get their permits to build their own buildings. Um, so we thought it was the perfect place to have this, this demonstration project. The site itself, the building is located um, in an urban redevelopment uh, near downtown, just north of downtown Austin. If you're familiar with the old 
Highland Mall campus is being redeveloped into a mixed use um, multifamily and commercial project with the Austin Community College being kind of the hub of this redevelopment. And then there's planned office and commercial and um, retail and multifamily kind of surrounding it. And um, our office building is located in this new, the, the, the PDC Permanent Development Center is located in this, this redevelopment. And there is sewer available to the site. So this is just a summary of the project. The, um, the alternative water source that we're really piloting here is the Blackwater reuse. We have lots of examples of rainwater and AC condensate reuse systems in Austin, but they, the vast majority of them are used for outdoor irrigation. And very, very few of them are you know, bringing the water indoors for toilet flushing and kind of having internal plumbing to a building. So in this case, we're, we're treating the building's black water and reusing it for toilet and urinal flushing. We can treat up to 5,000 gallons per day, which saves over 1 million gallons per year. The cost of the system was 1.7 million for the treatment system and then also to dual plumb the building to have a separate non-potable supply to the toilets and urinals. The annual O&M cost is still to be determined um, once we get the plant up and commissioned. Um, the building was finished in 2020, but it's not fully occupied due to the pandemic. And so there's just not enough wastewater being generated in the building at this point. Um, but we're hoping this summer that um, occupancy rates will start to go up and that we'll then be able to commission the Blackwater pilot plant. And Austin Water is gonna be the owner and operator of this facility. And then um, I should mention that rainwater and AC condensate are also collected on site and reused for irrigation and a decorative fountain. So there's actually two systems and they, they complement each other. Um, so in terms of experience with on-site reuse, we, um, we definitely, we've definitely learned some things here. We identified the permitting process through the state of Texas for domestic wastewater reuse. This facility is authorized under Chapter 321 of the Texas Administrative Code um, called Reclaimed Water Production Facilities. So it turns out, and I think uh, Robert Mace mentioned this earlier in his presentation, that um, if you already own a wastewater treatment plant and a sewer collection system, it's very, it's very easy to get a permit to do black water reuse in the building. Um, it took about six months to get our permit total, which is um, pretty fast for the TCQ permitting world. Um, but if you, uh, unfortunately, if you were a, a private building owner, if you just owned an office building in Austin and you wanted to do this, the permitting path is not so, not so simple. Um, and then we also successfully got a building permit from the city of Austin and, and worked through that for a first of its kind system. Um, you know, it took lots of meetings and, and getting together to explain like why we had this black water reuse treatment system. Um, you know, within the actual building development, but um, ultimately we were successful. In terms of a water supply offset, this is just, you know, a back of the back of the envelope calculation that our target for building scale reuse is 5.72 million gallons per day. This particular system can provide up to about 5,000 million gallons per day or 0 0.005 million gallons per day per system. So if this were gonna be the average size of systems going forward, we would need over a thousand of these systems to meet that 24 use target. So that's just kind of giving you an idea of the scale of this, of this type of um, system and building. As a technology test, this is an advanced treatment system. It's a membrane aerated bioreactor, which is a, a hybrid membrane system. It has two types of membranes in it actually. And um, it's providing nitrification and denitrification and should be able to achieve less than 20 milligrams per liter of total nitrogen in the effluent. Um, so providing tertiary treatment and very clean water to go into the building. In terms of criteria development, um, under the TCEQ regulations, you have to discharge your treatment solid back to the sewer system. Um, and so that pre presents challenges for the collection system that's re receiving that um, the treatment residuals and solids. Um, but we did a bit of research. There is a, a project in the city of Midland that has the only other 321P authorization in the state of Texas. And then there's um, some other examples from Australia um, where these types of systems exist. And so their recommended threshold for 
um, limiting the amount of solids that you put back in the sewer would be 600 milligrams per liter of TSS after mixing with the existing sewer flows. So it's very site specific. You, have, you want to have like enough wastewater coming down the pipe to be able to mix with your solids so that you're not causing um, blockages and, and build up. In terms of stretching our business model, um, Austin is part of the National Blue Ribbon Commission for On-Site and Non-Portable Water Systems, which, which is um, made up of utilities and public health agencies and regulators from around the US and, and now Canada. Um, and so they're advancing the practice and best practices of on-site reuse. And so it's a, you know, it's a network of these different organizations working on these things. Um, at San Francisco Public Utilities Commission in, in particular has a very similar ordinance and a regulatory approach that, that Austin is following. And so they have already figured out things like um, capacity charge adjustments or the, the, the fees that you pay to connect to um, a water and wastewater system to accommodate your kind of growth. You can get a credit for those um, because you don't, you're not gonna be relying on the, the potable water system or wastewater system as much as you would for just a regularly plumbed building. They figured out wastewater billing and crediting for, you know, if you are treating your own wastewater or gray water, you want to get a discount on your utility bill. And then they've also worked on metering requirements for how you can kind of account for all these different water sources within your development. So those are things that we're learning about how to incorporate into how we, the centralized utility that kind of incorporates these types of systems into their existing business model. In terms of education and community outreach, we put um, a, a good amount of money into the budget to plan for signage and for, for education efforts. And so um, we have a web page for the systems. We have a, a video um, kind of explaining what, how the systems work. We also have a very large sign here. This is um, this photo here on the right. It's the walkway between the building's parking garage and the, the office building itself. And then there's a very large sign there now that's shown on the left that um, you can't miss as you walk by that explains the two, there's two systems here. The rainwater is actually, the tanks are buried in that green field in the photo. And then the um, black water system is located kind of behind you underneath the walkway. And it just kind of explains how much uh, water the, the systems are saving and, and generally how they work. And then um, achieving a sustainability and adaptive management. So that's where kind of Oscar and Clara come in. Oscar stands for on-site collection and reuse of rainwater and condensate. It's a very simple system. It, it requires very little treatment to reuse that water because it started out pretty clean and then you're just using it for irrigation. So it doesn't need to undergo a lot of treatment. But then there's Clara, who's the closed loop advanced reclaim assembly who's treating the building's black water, the dirtiest of the, the on-site water sources, uh, purifying it and then putting it back in the building for toilet flushing. Um, and there's actually some interconnection between um, Oscar and Clara that when there's excess rainfall, um, that rainwater can be pumped over to the black water system to dilute some of the treatment solids and um, keep, up from, from, keep um, solids from building up there. And so these two systems together have reduced, can reduce the building's water use by um, potable water use, drinking water use by 75%. So that's pretty significant. And in terms of our lessons learned so far, we've learned many on top of trying to commission a, a building during a global pandemic, which presents its own, presents its own challenges. Um, but we have learned that additional costs can be incurred by not planning for reuse in the initial building design. Um, we actually, um, the building had been fully designed when the idea for this uh, demonstration project came about. And so we were kind of working retroactively to find a place where we're going to put this treatment plant. And I'll show you a photo where we ultimately um, placed it within the site. Um, the cross connection uh, plan reviewers, uh, that we need to get them involved early on in the process. Um, and, and make sure that they're reviewing the plans to make sure we're protecting the, the potable water supply from the non-potable water supply. I have this um, photo here on the right that's showing, um, it's a little hard to see, but if you look at um, the uh, third line down, there's the makeup potable water line going in beneath the reclaimed distribution line. And even though the plan showed that your makeup water line has to come in on top, so there's a physical separation and there's no potential cross connection. 
the plan showed that, but the, the plant was manufactured off site and they didn't get the memo. So this is how it showed up um, at the site. And then we had to have it replumbed. Um, In-person meetings with the city staff to explain the project and, a goal, and its goals. I think that was that went a long way to help the project get through the permitting process. Um, and then just plan for ongoing education at all levels of the organization. I like to tell the story of the um, one of the operators that, that came by to kind of check out the system as it was being constructed. And he was, he was just looking around kind of like, where, where is this plant going to discharge to? Like, where, where's the creek that this, this wastewater is going to? And he had to, you know, really explain that, you know, it's a reuse facility. The sewer system is the, is the backup for it. And, um, you know, you don't, you don't need a creek to discharge when you have, when you have a sewer system there. So it was like a very, it was like an aha moment for them. And they're just like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Um, and then this is just, you know, us taking the first step. So this, this is um, where we found the room, the space for the treatment plant. This is a, a walkway that was kind of bringing, um, the site has a street level grade, and then you have to kind of walk across this this um, walkway and then there's stairs to get down to the building level. And so this was just gonna be a, a concrete concrete space anyway. And so they carved out some space for both the uh, equipment room and then the treatment reactors that are kind of side by side and this is the crane lowering them in. And um, that's, that's where we put it. So that is all I have today. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Um, and thank you for being so speedy on this presentation. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna have a, a we want you to definitely put in a Q and A uh, as far as far as questions for Catherine in the in the question and answer section. Um, don't forget uh, we're gonna be hopefully answering some questions after after our next speaker, but uh, if not, uh, uh, Catherine and uh, Earl will probably answering it, um, typing out your the the answers. Um, after, uh, during the, after the, the total presentation. Thank you. Um, next um, speaker is going to be um, Mr. Earl Wood. And uh, he has been in the water treatment field since uh, 1992 and holds a Texas uh, AA water and wastewater license. He also has over 20 years experience in the SCADA uh, and computer um, automation integration and has been a part of many treatment system designs. He currently manages the Hearst Creek Municipal Utility District as the general manager. And I'm gonna pass it over to Mr. Wood. Uh, go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about taking backwash water from a negative to a positive. Hirsch Creek Mud is a small water and wastewater district located just west of Austin, and we primarily serve the Village of the Hills, which has about 1,200 customers. Hirsch Creek has a 3 million gallon per day treatment capacity with two Roberts filter units and one traditional upflow clarifier process. As you can see in this aerial photo, our backwash lagoon is located in the upper right of our facility and it's not very large, so it doesn't give us a lot of time for settling especially during the summer months. So this whole story kind of starts back in 2003 when we implemented a new disinfection process to meet the chlorine byproducts rule. We found that returning chlorinated water to a free chlorine zone did not work very well. Also during this time, water conservation was not a big issue and there was also a concern with backwash water having concentrated crypto and giardia loading. It was generally felt and that sending the backwash water to the wastewater treatment plant was the best option. And this is what we decided to do. Uh, we saw some photos earlier of, of this, uh, continued until 2011. I'm sure you all remember this year. And like many others, we felt the impact of a severe drought and we began looking for ways to conserve water. One of the first low hanging fruit projects that we came up with was retreatment of our backwash water. We estimated that we could potentially recover 20 to 30 million gallons per year, and this, this would also have the added benefit of reducing load on our wastewater treatment plant as well. 
We put together a team which consisted of our district engineer, James Merchant and Zach Curtis. We intended to do much of the work in-house using our process implementation and SCADA team. This included myself, Stacy Johnson and Kevin Sponseller. Through the process, we also included H2K Technologies and Calgon for their granular activated carbon. Lastly, we became aware of the water conservation grant program from the LCRA and after submitting an application, Hurst Creek Mud was awarded $100,000 for the project. As we started the planning process, we established several areas of concern. The backwash recover system must remove suspended solids and ammonia. <clears throat> it, excuse me. It cannot increase chlorine byproducts, TOCs, or have any other adverse effects on the water treatment facility. The system also cannot overflow, overflow the backwash lagoon. And lastly, it must fit in a small footprint. One other concern we had when considering this process is that we did not want to add a system that required a lot of hands-on operations. And we knew that whatever we came up with, we wanted to fully automate in uh, the treatment design. At Hurst Creek Mud, we are very strong in design and implementation and perform all of our SCADA work in-house. This gave us a big advantage in designing and automating the new process. We then turned to a lot of testing. We performed a small pilot study, which included testing the sludge settling time using GAC for ammonia, chlorine, chlorine byproduct, and TOC removal. This was a very tedious process with a lot of lab testing, and our operators definitely got tired of running lab tests. After the pilot study and testing, we came up with a basic treatment concept. First, we discovered that we would need to have an automated delay of backwash recovering operation after any discharge, either through backwashing filters, rinsing, or wasting sludge from our upflow clarifier. We would additionally need to install extra settling beyond just our lagoon. We would also need to inject additional chlorine to oxidize and bind up any free ammonia. And we chose to add a multimedia filter to remove an uns any unsettled solids and this also added a little more detention time for the injected chlorine. Lastly, we chose to use granulate activated carbon to remove all of the residual chlorine before returning the water to the treatment process. The main components then became an inclined plate settler, a 2000 gallon settling tank with a sludge collector, three multimedia sand filters, a chlorine injection system, and two GAC vessels. Additionally, all pumps would be VFD driven so that the operators could set different flow rates and we added a 10,000 gallon treated water tank for buffering and for backwash water. Two online chlorine analyzers would be used to monitor the chlorine injection and removal. And as I said earlier, full automation through our SCADA system. After this, we worked with our engineering team to draw up a design. We selected H2K technologies for their small footprint inclined plate settler three pressure filters with Bray automatic MOB actuators, and two pressure GAC units. So on January 5th, 2016, we received approval from the TCEQ for construction. After startup and some fine tuning, we ran a full list of lab tests to see how the system worked. The results were very encouraging. The treatment system removed all chloramines, free chlorine, and ammonia. It greatly reduced the chlorine byproducts and TOCs. This also reduced the overall byproducts and TOCs for the entire water treatment facility. By performing much of the work in-house, we were able to keep the cost of the project down and completed it with a total cost of just under 412,000. We estimated this was about a third of what it would have cost the district had we used the traditional contractor method. Lastly, since we finished the project on April 19, 2017, we have averaged 70% recovery or about 15 million gallons per year of water recycled. To finish up, I'd like to show just a few photos of our construction. We did use subcontractors for the slab and for the metal building. Here we are installing the inclined plate settler and also unloading the filter and GAC units from, from H2K. There was a ton of work building the header for the filters and wiring all of those electrical connections. And here are a few photos of the finished product from the outside. 
Also a few photos of the control panels that we built and the VFD in the middle and chlorine analyzer on the side. And a couple more photos of the inside after we finished up. Lastly, here is the main overview page of the SCADA system for the backwash. And uh, we did a, a ton of work and a lot of our guys uh, spent many, many extra hours trying to get this thing all done up and working. Thank you very much for your time. And we wanna give a special thank you to the LCRA for partnering with us in this successful project. And that's all I have. Thank you, thank you so much, Earl. Uh, let me see here. I don't see any questions uh, in the Q&A. So I'm just gonna go ahead and ask a, a, a question uh, for um, Catherine. Catherine, if you wanna pop back on. Um, did we have any um, people in the community um, that, that supported our project? Can you talk a little bit about that? If there's any, uh, um, I guess, community feedback on, on, on this project? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think there there was general support when the when the project was getting going. Um, you know, we got council uh, approval from our city council to fund the project. Um, we also have a um, the task force implementing the water forward plan that are you know proponents of this type of system. Um, I think we'll have a lot more in engagement and opportunity for feedback from the community once the system's up and running and people can come visit the building and see the systems in action. Um, but right now, you know, due to the pandemic, it's just limited interaction with the public. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and Earl, I guess, I guess I was, I was wondering, you saved all that, all that, um, uh, money and stuff Did you get like a, a bonus or bonus check for that or something. <laughs> oh, they, they treat us well here. <laughs> well, um, I appreciate you guys uh, hurrying through, trying to keep us on schedule here. I'm going to go ahead and uh, pass it over to uh, Megan, who's going to head up our next uh, section. Thank you so All much. Right, thank you.